stuff. So essentially, if you're identifying as an Anglo-Saxon, you essentially believe the only real white people are Northern Europeans. And you don't believe like Slavs, you don't believe Mediterranean peoples who have white skin, you don't believe lots of different groups who have white skin are actually white. The only real white people are Scandinavians and Northern Europeans. And with that in mind, you guys remember this from about a year ago, Marjorie Taylor Greene launches America First Caucus pushing for Anglo-Saxon political tradition, bringing together a group of far-right lawmakers known for their controversial rhetoric. And in the actual document that was leaked, it said, America is a nation with a border and a culture and strengthened by a common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions. History has shown that societal trust and political unity are threatened when foreign citizens are imported en masse into a country, particularly without institutional support for assimilation and an expansive welfare state to bail. Turns out some of the most nutty and far-right members of the Republican Party were making a new America First caucus talking about having Anglo-Saxon political traditions. Now, as an English person, this struck me as very strange because, of course, we're taught about the Anglo-Saxons from a young age. And most people in this country know what that is, but it's not a term in wide use in the UK. Unless you're just like an insanely old school bigoted person, most people don't talk about this stuff anymore. But in America, it has been a thing. If any of you have studied books like The Great Gatsby, you may have looked at WASPs, which stands for white anglo-saxon protestant and looked at their culture because the great gatsby as a book is examining this culture but what we're going to do in this video is talk about the america first caucus talk about what they say these traditions are then we're going to get into how anglo-saxon is often just a racist dog whistle particularly in america then we're going to talk about the history of the anglo-saxons to describe how ridiculous it is that racists often use these guys as sort of something to aspire to be like they're a very homogenous group and then we're going to talk about the battle over the term anglo-saxon because there's a very interesting drama with history as an academic study i did my degree in history so i'm very passionate about this stuff but it's about the field of anglo-saxon history and how historically it's been used to push racism. But I thought I'd start off with what gave me the idea for this video, and of course I already mentioned it, but let's get into Vice's coverage of the story. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates launch Anglo-Saxon America First Caucus, a group of the House's most extreme right-wing Republicans is launching a new caucus to push President Trump's values. So they also said they have an explicit pledge to push Anglo-Saxon political traditions. So, scandal-plagued Florida GOP rep Matt Gates announced he was joining Marjorie Taylor Greene's new America First caucus group on Friday, just hours after a draft memo leaked that outlined the organization's barely veiled racism. The seven-page memo states the group has been formed to follow in President Trump's footsteps and potentially step on some toes and sacrifice sacred cows for the good of the American nation. America is a nation with a border, a culture, strengthened by a common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions, the memo reads. History has shown that societal trust and political unity are threatened when foreign citizens are imported en masse into a country, particularly without institutional support for assimilation and an expansive welfare state to bail them out should they fail to contribute positively to this country. So the racism there is very overt, but someone leaked part of it. So I want to get into it more. We've already read part of it. So here are some eye-popping sections of the literature. So under the immigration section, so part of what I've already read, but then it goes on to say, while certain economic and financial interest groups benefit Im immensely from mass immigration, legal as well as illegal, and the aggregate output of the country increases, the reality of large segments of the society, as well as the long-term existential future of America as a unique country of a unique culture and a unique identity, is, p is being put at unnecessary risk. Is something our leaders cannot afford to ignore. So under the infrastructure section, we'll work towards an infrastructure that reflects architectural, engineering, and aesthetic value that befits the progeny of European architecture, whereby public infrastructure must be utilitarian as well as stunningly, classically beautiful, befitting a world power and a source of freedom. Now, there's so much inherent irony in that they're using Anglo-Saxon traditions and political identity and then using it to be extremely anti-immigrant because it's even in the word Anglo-Saxon 
the Saxons were not from the British Isles. They came from Germany and they took over as like the political elite and they became a massive, you know, ethnic group in Britain and England at the time. But again, they were immigrants to start with. They're not native to the British Isles. So it's very, very ironic and pretty funny to me that you're using a term like Anglo-Saxon while pushing real xenophobic rhetoric. And aren't these America first guys like massive patriots? Like why are you trying to import like <laughs> ancient English culture and talk about their political traditions? But if you know the first thing about the Anglo-Saxons and the politics of them and you know the hierarchy of them and everything, it's not like they gave us democracy or, or freedom. Like it's a real weird thing to talk about the political traditions of the Anglo-Saxons. And even if we're talking about religion at the time people like alfred the great not as like austere and you know puritan as a lot of the christians that settled america you know he wanted to translate the bible into old english and after alfred the great's time translating the bible literally like caused wars there's something called the hussite rebellion in bohemia where these czech people wanted to translate the bible inspired by john wycliffe who was an english guy in the 1300s who did translate the bible into english to help just, you know, your average layman who could read, read the Bible because at this time, the only people who could read the Bible were monks and priests and the aristocracy. But this whole issue to me just shows that you either have to push revisionist history, and we're going to get into that, about the Saxons and the Anglo-Saxons, or you just do not understand what they are, and it's just a racist dog whistle for white Protestant. Now, there's a good passage I was reading from a book, and I want to share it with you guys, and it's called The Origins of Racial Anglo-Saxonism in Great Britain Before 1850. So this isn't anything new, and it happened in Britain as well, where Anglo-Saxonism stopped meaning like Alfred the Great and Athelstan, the first real king of England who were Saxons, and started meaning something very exclusionary, where you just put certain people on a pedestal as these are like the superior race, and these people are the owners of Europe or the owners of England. So just want to read this for you quick. So by Reginald Horsman, although a belief in Anglo-Saxon racial superiority was a vital ingredient in, Engli in English and American thought of the 19th century, the study of this belief has, has been largely neglected by historians. The best work is that of L. P. Curtis, who in studying anti-Irish prejudice in the second half of the 19th century has analysed far broader aspects of Anglo-Saxonism. Curtis points out that this Anglo-Saxonism of the middle and late 19th century was far different from the earlier 16th and 17th century adulation of the Anglo-Saxon period as a golden age of free institutions. A belief in Anglo-Saxons' freedom once used to defend popular liberties had by the middle of the 19th century been transformed into a rationale for the domination of peoples throughout the world. The heyday of Anglo-Saxonism came in the late 19th century, but the essential transformation had occurred earlier. Although Curtis has effectively analysed aspects of Anglo-Saxonism in the last half of the 19th century, little detailed attention has been devoted to the process by which earlier stress on Anglo-Saxon liberties was by 1850 transformed into a racist doctrine. The myth of Anglo-Saxon England had its origins in the 16th century. The break with Rome and the creation of an English church stimulated an interest in the primitive Anglo-Saxon church Reformers wished to demonstrate that England was merely returning to older, purer religious practices dating from before the Norman Conquest, practices which had been lost in subsequent centuries. Now that is pretty interesting, talking about how this vision of Anglo-Saxon England just changed throughout the centuries. And he's talking about there is when Henry VIII built the Church of England, and England essentially became Protestant and some people saw that as Henry VIII taking it back to Alfred the Great's time where the English church was more independent but he talks about anti-Irish racism there and like I said a lot of fascist and far-right people believe in this Anglo-Saxon thing because Anglo-Saxon culture and English culture at the time was a mixture of Old English, German peoples and other peoples from like the Netherlands, of course people from Norway and Denmark and it's not surprising this sort of groups are seen as you know old Nazis like Nazi Germany as you know the pure races of Europe and the masters of, of Europe as well 